วัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today we're going to be exploring Buddhist chanting to help you develop your chanting practice that will help ease the mind into meditation and get more benefit out of your meditation sessions. So I would like to welcome you to our live stream and our online interactive classes. Where on Sunday, Wednesday, and Saturday we teach right here online. Whether you're watching this on Facebook, YouTube, or one of the other venues that we live stream to, you'll be able to ask questions as we go in our class today. So we have our moderator James and also Max helping us. So as you have questions, feel free to type those into the comment section of Facebook, YouTube, or in the Zoom virtual classroom. And those of you in the Zoom virtual classroom, you're welcome to raise your hand electronically and get any help or ask any follow-up questions that you might have as we get going in our class today. So thank you for joining. Welcome. Glad that you're here, and would be interested to learn the teachings of Gautama Buddha through learning some chanting. So as we get started today, let's just. First, talk about the benefits of chanting and how chanting can benefit you. Chanting is a practice that we I do prior to meditation and also at the end of meditation. When Gautama Buddha shared his teachings about going into meditation, he talked about setting up mindfulness in front of you. And from my experience, chanting is something that can help set up mindfulness in front of you. What mindfulness is is awareness of mind, having the awareness of mind or attentiveness of mind, alertness of mind. Because in this practice of progressing towards enlightenment, one of the primary steps on the Eightfold Path, the path to enlightenment, is awareness of mind or 
right mindfulness. So entering meditation, it's important to have awareness of mind because you're going to be actively training the mind during meditation. And in order to do that, it's very helpful to set up mindfulness in front of you. So in chanting, it helps to bring awareness or alertness of mind. It also helps you develop concentration or memory because in order to actually develop a chanting practice, you need to have a certain amount of memory as you learn the chants day by day and concentrate on remembering them and actually doing the chants prior to meditation and at the end of meditation. You also need awareness of breath entering into meditation because the primary form of meditation that Gautama Buddha taught is breathing mindfulness meditation. We focus on the breath in order to cut the thoughts or let go of the thoughts and train the mind to reside in the present moment. And in doing so, it's helpful that you have this awareness of the breath as you enter into meditation. So in chanting, you need to have a certain awareness of the breath in order to actually chant because there's pauses in between the actual verses of the chanting where you need to be taking in breaths and at the end of each phrase you need to be taking in a nice deep breath which helps you to start becoming aware of the breath to ultimately get better results once you're actually meditating. The chanting also helps to kind of slow the mind or relax the mind and kind of ease it into meditation. Because if you just tried to kind of plop down and do meditation, which you've probably done in the past, you'll get a certain amount of benefit out of that. But to actually ease the mind down into meditation with some chanting, it kind of puts this buffer between whatever you're doing in normal life in your meditation. It kind of helps to relax the mind and kind of ease it into meditation and then also ease it out of meditation on the backside. So ultimately it will help you to get more benefit out of the meditation itself because if you were just to plop down with a real active busy mind into meditation, it would take you quite a while perhaps to actually gain control of the mind and kind of slow it down and actually get the benefits out of meditation. Where is if you put this chanting in between your decision to meditate and your actual meditation, you can actually kind of ease the mind and kind of relax it into meditation. When you're early in your meditation practice or even as you get going for several months or years, you might have challenges to observe the benefits in your actual meditation practice. You should be able to see that the mind's gradually becoming more peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, but the mind oftentimes becomes very busy or you might feel that the mind is busy or because this change is so gradual over time, you might actually have trouble kind of observing this at different times. So what chanting really does is it kind of gives you that audible indication that your practice is improving and it can be very motivating and encouraging because when you first start chanting, of course, you're just starting. So you're not going to be an expert in this. And when you chant, it's going to not sound as good as it will when you've been chanting for three months or six months. So as you chant each day before your meditation and after your meditation, you will hear the chants getting better and better and better. And this provides you some encouragement and motivation to continue your practice of meditation. And this audible sound of your chanting will help you to observe the improvements in your practice. One of the other things that chanting does is it helps to cultivate this respect or gratitude toward the elders because these chants in all of the teachings of Gautama Buddha have been passed down for 2,500 years from the lifetime of the Buddha until today. And it's been one person after another, after another, after another who have preserved these teachings, shared them and passed them down from one person to the next. There is no centralized organization that collects all the teachings and distributes them out throughout the world. So all of the work that has been done to preserve 
the Buddhist teachings and pass them down to today has been done by the generosity of individuals who are sharing their time, effort, energy, and resources to share the teachings person to person to person throughout the last 2,500 years. So there's a certain amount of gratitude and respect that I have for all of these people whom I don't know their names, I never will know their names, I will never meet these people because they're long in the past, but there's enormous amount of respect and gratitude that I have for all that work that has been done over the last 2,500 years to get to the point where we are today. And in order to attain enlightenment and continue to progress on this path, there's various mental qualities that need to be cultivated in the mind. Respect and gratitude for all people is part of those qualities that we need to cultivate in the mind. Oftentimes we're taught in Western culture to only respect people if they've earned our respect. Well, this doesn't really lead to an enlightened mind because in order to determine if someone's earned your respect, it means that you have to judge that person in order to see if they've earned your respect. And if you're judging somebody, then you're not going to experience enlightenment. And if you're not respecting people from the beginning and just respect all beings, that means if you're not respecting people, then perhaps you're disrespecting people. So if we're disrespecting people and we're judging people as well, then you're not going to experience enlightenment. So one of the things that this practice of chanting can do is it can cultivate this respect and gratitude in the mind towards these elders, these people that you've never met or you'll never know. And then that can help translate into helping you to have gratitude and respect for all beings currently in this life now that you're currently living. And this can be very beneficial for your path to training the mind to the enlightened mental state. And one of the things I always am, is important for me to share as part of teaching chanting is to ensure that you know that there is no magical, mystical benefits associated with chanting. There's all these various chants in the world that have been shared over the years, and there is no magical, mystical benefit with these chants. For example, you wouldn't be able to say a chant to extend your life or you wouldn't be able to say a chant that's going to make you more wealthy or say a chant that is going to lead to enlightenment by itself you can't say a chant that's going to immediately eliminate unwholesome gamma for example and kind of uh, uh, burn this up or eliminate it from your life that's not what chanting has been used for throughout the years in this tradition of Theravada Buddhist teachings. Essentially what chanting has been used for is memorization of the teachings. The teachings that we have, the most complete and largest collection of these teachings are in the Pali Canon or the Pali text. This is the largest collection of teachings that we have access to. And for many centuries now, people have remembered these chant these teachings in the Pali language and have used chanting as a way of remembering those teachings and passing them down from person to person to person. So reciting chants has no inherent mystical, magical benefits that's going to poof and instantly create any kind of beneficial result for you. So chanting isn't in order to pray, for example, if you've been used to praying in certain traditions, chanting is not praying and asking for some beneficial result from some higher power. Essentially what it is, is the practice in order to train the mind to accomplish the things that we just talked about, like developing awareness of mind, concentration, memory, developing awareness of the breath, to help slow the mind down, relax it, and ease it into meditation. It can help provide you this audible indication to motivate and encourage your practice while you're developing this respect and gratitude for the elders and people in the past that have passed these teachings down from one person to the next. So as you're chanting and you're learning chanting, keep in mind that you're not creating any beneficial outcome 
from some higher power or some third entity. This practice of the path to enlightenment is all about learning teachings to practice those teachings which train the mind and allow you to independently observe the truth in the teachings to gain wisdom. And this wisdom then helps the mind to function through this newfound wisdom of these natural laws of existence that you can independently verify with the guidance of teachers. And as you gain more and more wisdom through these teachings and confirming the truth for yourself, you will see that the mind will gradually function more and more optimally where the mind will move to this enlightened mental state where it's peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy permanently, where the mind no longer experiences discontent feelings such as sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, guilt, shame, fears, boredom, loneliness, shyness, resentment, jealousy. All of these discontent feelings can be eliminated through developing a practice along this path to enlightenment. So in this group learning program, we use this book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Nibbana. Nibbana is just the Pali way to refer to enlightenment. And here on this channel and in this group that you're part of, and we live stream on Sunday, the chapter that we're covering in this particular week and then on Wednesday, we do breathing mindfulness meditation, loving kindness meditation, or we explore Buddhist chanting, which we're doing today. And then on Saturday, we do breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation, which starting on January 9th will evolve into our further program where we're going to be teaching the Pali Canon in English. So we're going to be sharing not only meditation on Saturdays, but we're actually going to be diving into the books of Buddha Vajana, which means the words of the Buddha. And there's 13 books in this series that on Saturday, we're going to be exploring these through the actual words of the Buddha. These books are a curation of the Pali Canon where a team of about 100 or 200 people have extracted the most important teachings of the Buddha in his own words. And when they assembled these books, you can actually now learn them in a consolidated format with the guidance of teacher. And on Saturdays, we're going to start doing that on January 9th. But until then, we're going to actually just be doing meditation on Saturdays. So you're welcome to join us on any of those days to learn and practice the teachings of Gautama Buddha. So we're going to move into actually learning the chants. But before I do, I would just like to pause and see if our moderators have any questions that have come in through any of the various platforms related to the benefits of chanting before we actually move into learning the chanting chants themselves. Hi, David. Max has a question to kick us off. He'd like to know, does slowing the breathing down help to calm the mind? Yes. In fact, the more attentive a practitioner is to the actual breath, the more the mind will slow down. So you can use the mind to slow down the breath. And then as the breath slows down, it helps to slow down the mind. So there's kind of like a multiple benefits there. And we're not trying to really control the breath in meditation, but we need to be aware of the breath. And if the breath is too rapid and too fast, we need to kind of slow that down without necessarily trying to control it, but just kind of easing the breath to kind of a natural, uh, calm, peaceful pace. And when you're chanting, you're actually observing that breath and kind of slowing the breath down because while you're chanting, if you exhale too quickly, then you're going to be out of breath before you get to the end of the phrase or to a point where you can actually take in a breath. Or if you breathe too slowly, you're going to be holding the breath back and the sound isn't going to project in your chanting. So what you'll learn is this, that singing and chanting and these things are all about breath 
control and kind of being aware of the breath and ensuring that your breath is such that you have enough air in the body in order to execute the chant. So this chanting practice is a big part of that is becoming aware of the breath so that you can actually move into the chanting and then ultimately that awareness of breath is going to help slow down the mind and ease the mind into meditation and get more benefit out of the meditation itself. That's the only question we have at this time. Okay, so moving to the very first chant that I would like to share with you. This is a common chant that you will see throughout the Theravada tradition. This Theravada tradition is known as the tradition of teachings that is interested in maintaining the teachings as close to what the Buddha actually taught during his lifetime as possible. And there's various places where the Theravada tradition are, is taught throughout the world. At this point, the Theravada teachings and Theravada temples are spread all throughout the world. But the vast majority of the teachings and kind of like the host of these teachings are in places like Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, southern Vietnam. These are places where practitioners and the populations of people in those areas are practicing these teachings the most. You'll see the most temples and the most resources, the most ordained practitioners, the most household practitioners in those regions of the world. But in reality, these teachings have been spread through various temples and ordained practitioners and household practitioners are all over the world. So by you learning these Pali chants in the Pali language, not only will you be able to learn and actually chant in our community that we have here online and here in Chiang Mai, but you will also be able to plug in to any Theravada location that's a meditation center or a temple or a Vihara, anywhere that people are practicing the Theravada teachings, they will be chanting in this same Pali language. So in Sri Lanka, they may have a little bit of a unique dialect or in Vietnam or Myanmar or Laos versus Thailand. But the base chant in the base language of Pali is going to be the same. And it's often that various practitioners, either ordained or household practitioners, will come together from these various regions of the world. And having never met each other ever, they can actually sit down in a temple and actually chant these together. So through learning and practicing these chants on your own and through this program, you'll actually be able to plug into any different community or venue around the world that is practicing the Theravada teachings and chant right along with them. Because any event that these various venues hold, they will typically start off with this chant and the whole community chanting together. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to chant it first and then as a class we can chant it together. So the way that this chant goes is you place your hands palm to palm, usually at your sternum, and then you would take in a nice deep breath and then start to chant this first phrase. Ara hang sama sam hotom hakawa. And then there's a breath here, kind of like a half breath. Potang hakawan hang apiwa te me. And then at the end of this phrase, people in a large community who are sitting on the floor will typically place their head and kind of prostrate to the floor. Or you might see people take their hands and place them up to their forehead as a way of kind of, you know, putting a period at the end of that phrase and showing respect to the Buddha because this first phrase is all about showing respect and gratitude to the Buddha. The second phrase goes like this. Sawakato Mahakavata Tammo. A little half breath. 
Dhamang Namasami. And once again, either bowing to the floor or place your hands up to your forehead. And then the last phrase here. Supatipano Mahakawato. Little half breath. Sawaka Sanko. Little half breath. Sankang Namami. And then once again, a bow. This chant is referred to as the triple gem or the triple jewel. Whenever you see three in the Buddhist teachings, there is a representation of the triple gem or the triple jewel. And that represents the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. These are the Pali words. But in English, we're talking about the fully, perfectly enlightened Buddha, Master Teacher Gautama Buddha. And the second phrase, the Dhamma, this is the teachings, the teachings that he shared that leads to the enlightened mental state. And the Sangha, this is the community of practitioners, both ordained and household practitioners. And in order to attain enlightenment, one would need to have confidence in the Buddha, they would need to have access to his teachings, and they would need to be part of a community. And in order for someone to attain enlightenment, you would need all three of these things. Without confidence in the actual Buddha that he actually attained enlightenment and was a Buddha, why would anyone ever be interested in learning and practicing his teachings? So there needs to be confidence that this man actually was enlightened. And if you've ever learned or been exposed to any amount of his teachings and actually used them to benefit your life, that can help you to build your confidence in the Buddha that he was indeed enlightened because you see his teachings are actually benefiting your life. Then you would need access to the teachings the real actual teachings of the Buddha. And that's what I share in this book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Nibbana. There's actual words of his in there, as well as mine helping explain the teachings, which you can download for free, or you can get a printed copy if you like on Amazon. And then I also share these books, Developing, I'm sorry, Buddha Wajana, which Buddha Wajana means the words of the Buddha. So through these various books and texts, and then I've taken a lot of these and moved them into audiobook, videos, podcasts, quizzes, online classes, personal guidance, all these different things. These are the actual teachings of the Buddha or the Dhamma. And then having access or having being part of the community or the Sangha, it's important to have a community because you need access to teachers that can help guide you on this path and having other members of this community encourage and support you where you can have discussion and dialogue and actually participate in practicing the teachings as a community this is very beneficial to one's practice in fact you wouldn't be able to attain enlightenment without guidance from a teacher Nowadays, there's all too often that people are kind of off trying to dig through books or just watch a YouTube video or, you know, take in a little bit of content from the Internet here and there. And they're trying to kind of piece together their understanding of what they think the Buddha actually taught. While this may have been what got you started, you wouldn't actually be able to attain enlightenment that way. The only person that can attain enlightenment on their own without the guidance of a teacher would be an actual Buddha. That's one of the things that actually makes a Buddha a Buddha, which is they're self-awakened, meaning they only attain enlightenment through their own pursuit without any guidance from any teachers. They then share the teachings with others during their lifetime and lead countless other people to enlightenment. And then upon their death, those teachings that they self-discovered in their self-awakening and that they shared with people throughout their lifetime are then left behind with others in a condition that can continue to create enlightenment and lead people to enlightenment after the Buddha's death. The last Buddha currently known to the world existed over two years ago 
And as far as the entire world understands, there has not been a Buddha since then. So in order to attain enlightenment and progress on this path, you're going to need a teacher to help provide guidance for you. And that's where the Sangha or the community comes in to help provide you that guidance and support that you need. So it's very important that you have confidence in the Buddha, that you have access to his teachings, and that you're part of the community of practitioners, which will help to inform your practice and guide you on this path to enlightenment. The actual teachings themselves are independently verifiable. There is no belief in these teachings. So what your the role of the teacher is to share the teachings with you in a way that you can then go off and practice them and independently confirm the truth for yourself and gain wisdom as part of this path. And this is essentially the same thing that you've done with everything in your life, whether it was learning the ABCs or learning to read or learning to write or learning how to play tennis or football or anything that you've ever experienced in your life, you've essentially had some teachers guiding you along the way. And then the more and more proficient you became with those teachings, you were able to go off and actually do these things by yourself, like reading, writing, playing football, playing tennis, or whatever it is that you've actually learned throughout your life. So these teachings to attain enlightenment are just the same. You need guidance and teachers to help you along this path. Otherwise, you would have no ability to actually understand the teachings and ask questions because you can't ask questions to a book or you can't ask questions to a website or a YouTube video. You need to seek guidance in the community of practitioners. So this first chant is a way to show respect and gratitude towards these three things, the Buddha, the teachings, and the community that is supporting you and encouraging you along this path. So I would like to invite you to chant this together as a class where I will say this chant three times so that we can go through this three different times and help build your proficiency in actually saying this chant. And if this is the first time you've ever done these chants, you know, it's going to feel a little bit awkward. It might feel a little bit weird. You might kind of stumble through some of the pronunciations a little bit, but that's okay. That's all part of learning and it makes it fun and enjoyable. And each time you do it, you'll get better and better and better at these chants. So let's come together as a class. Put your hands at your sternum, palm to palm. Take a nice deep breath inhaling and now let's do these chants three different times nice deep breath arahang samma samhoto mahakava half a breath potang mahakavanang apivate ami Nice bow with the breath. Savakato Mahakavata Tamo. Half a breath. Damang Namasami. Bow with the breath. Supatipano Mahakavato. Half a breath. Savaka Sangho. Breath. Sanghang Namami. Bow with the breath. Now I won't cue the breath the next two ver ways, the next two times through. Arahang Samma Samhoto Mahakava Potang Mahakavandhang Apivate Ami Sa 
सवखातो महाकवता तम्मो तामं नमसामि सुपाध्यपानो महाकवतो सावकासंघो संघं नमामि आरहं सम्मासमोतो महाकवा भोतं महाकवनं अपिवाते अमि सवखातो महाकवता तम्मो दामं नमसामि सुपाध्यपानो महाकवतो सावकासंघो संघं नमामि Okay, so this is the triple gem, and it's really helpful, I think, to understand the English translations here because it puts some more intention behind the actual chant so that you know what you're actually saying in this Pali language. That first phrase, the arahang, this translation is the perfectly enlightened one is worthy and rightly self-awakened. I bow down before the awakened, perfectly enlightened one. So this is essentially declaring that Gautama Buddha is an actual Buddha, referring to him as the perfectly enlightened one, is worthy and self-awakened. And it's important to note that this particular chant isn't something that he taught and required people to actually chant and actually bow down to him. From everything <clears throat> that I understand, I'm pretty sure that this chant came after his death as a way of honoring and respecting him. It's not something that shows up in the actual Pali Canon itself, so I only can think that this came after his death. And a fully perfectly enlightened Buddha doesn't have conceit or arrogance and pride walking around measuring and comparing himself to others, placing himself above people. So he wouldn't have taught people to worship him and bow down to him as part of his teachings. But during his lifetime, people did actually bow to him, but it's something that they chose to do out of respect and gratitude towards him for sharing his teachings. But he didn't institute this chant as a way to ensure people respected him. It's something that people chose to do on their own afterwards. So that's this first chant, respecting the perfectly enlightened one. The second phrase here is, the Dhamma is well expounded by the perfectly enlightened one. Remember the Dhamma are the teachings. So what this is saying is the teachings are well expounded, well explained, clearly, concisely, directly, and profoundly explained by the perfectly enlightened one. I pay respect to the teachings, right? That's what this second phrase is referring to. And then the third phrase is the Sangha or the community of practitioners, both ordained and household practitioners of the perfectly enlightened one. So the, essentially the students of the perfectly enlightened one, one's dis, uh, dis, disciples have practiced well. So essentially what you're doing is you're acknowledging 
that the community of people who are learning and practicing the Buddhist teachings have a very good practice. They're polite, they're kind, they're friendly, they're respectful, they're practicing very well these teachings. I pay respect to the Sangha or the community. And that's the triple gem or the triple jewel. And this will open up pretty much every event that you participate in in the Theravada tradition. So learning and practicing this chant can be very helpful for your meditation practice, but also help you when you join in to any events that you might join through any communities of temples or various places around the world that are practicing the Theravada teachings. So let's see if there's any questions on this chant or anything that I've been discussing so far. Hi, David. I was wondering, when we're chanting, is it important that we keep in mind these meanings of the chants? I think it does help because then the phrases have some meaning behind them rather than just kind of empty words that you're reciting you actually put some meaning behind it and i think it helps to uh, encourage and motivate and invigorate your practice because you really know what you're actually chanting so i think it can really help you progress in your practice and put some real intention behind what it is that you're chanting all right david we have one more question but it's not exactly related to chanting so we may want to save that to the end okay sounds good and as we get going here we've got a few people here in our uh, zoom classroom i'm just curious if you guys have any interest to actually practice these we did that three weeks ago and i think we did it before that if if not, we can just move on, but I just thought I would pause and see if there's anybody who's interested in actually practicing these. Doesn't look like it. Okay, so we'll just keep moving through the chants and teach these today, okay? So the next chant is what I refer to as the Natmo Tassa. This is a very, very common chant. It's probably the most basic and simple chant that there is. And oftentimes when you're first learning chanting, if somebody wants to kind of focus and kind of build their practice slowly, you might actually start with just learning this particular chant and only this chant because the syllables in this chant show up in other chants. So by learning this one, it will actually help you with the other chants that you learn. And as a child growing up here in Thailand, if you're going to learn the Buddhist teachings and your family is going to help you learn that, this is typically the first chant that they will teach you. So when I observed this about Thai society and Thai culture, when I started embarking on the journey to learn chants, I actually started with this chant and only chanted this chant for quite a while until I gained some proficiency with it. Then I moved on to the Arahang Samba Samputasa. So if you would like to kind of simplify things, you could just use this chant for a few weeks until you build some proficiency and then move in to the other chants that I'm gonna teach you today. But you could also just learn them all at one time as well if you want. And one of the ways that you can make that easier for you is to have a sheet like this. This is a, a one page kind of laminated sheet that I provide in our Facebook group, Daily Wisdom Walking the Path with the Buddha. If you go to the files menu of that Facebook group, you will see this one page that you can actually print out front and back and maybe laminate it and keep it next to your meditation area so that as you go into meditation and you come out of meditation, you can actually reference this one page and then help you and guide you in your practice. And if you don't download that and use that in the book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Nibbana, these chants are in the chapter 11. So if you go into chapter 11, you'll see these same chants in there. And if you're watching this video, you're also welcome to screenshot this as well and take screenshots since I'm displaying the chants on the screen. This second chant is 
respect for the Buddha. It's all about showing respect for the Buddha. And once again, this is a chant that, as far as I know, came after his death. The way that this chant goes is you say the same verse three times. So it would be with your palms together at your sternum, and it would sound like this. Take a nice deep breath, and then I would go, Half a breath. So there, notice there's no bow at the end of each one of these, and there's that half a breath right in the middle of the verse in order for you to kind of ensure that you have enough air to kind of complete the whole phrase. And there's some people that might just take one big breath and actually chant all the way through. But when you're a part of a community, whoever the leader is of that community, the f people who are coming to learn at that center will typically adopt chanting very similar to the leader of that venue. So what I noticed is pretty much all the venues that I've ever been to, they will actually pause at that midpoint and people will kind of take a half a breath at that point. So I would like to invite you to chant this together as a class and it's three verses and we'll do it three times. So essentially we'll do this nine times. So bring your palms together. I'll cue the breath at the beginning and then I'll just leave it to you to know where the breath is at that point. Take a nice deep breath. Napmo adhasa bhagavato. Breath. Arahato sama samputasa. Breath. Napmo adhasa bhagavato. Half breath. Arahato sama samputasa. Breath. Napmo adhasa bhagavato. Half breath. Arahato sama samputasa. Now let's do this three verses two more times. Napmo adhasa bhagavato. Arahato sama samputasa. Napmo adhasa bhagavato. Arahato sama samputasa. Napmo adhasa bhagavato. Arahato sama samputasa. Now we'll do another three verses. Napmo adhasa bhagavato. Arahato sama samputasa. Napmo adhasa bhagavato. Arahato sama samputasa. Napmo adhasa bhagavato. Arahato sama samputasa. 
Okay, so that's the Napmo Tasa. And the English translation here is respect to the perfectly enlightened one, the worthy one, the rightly self-awakened one. Right? Once again, just reaffirming respect and gratitude to the Buddha for his work of 45 years of sharing these teachings into the world and ensuring that there's actually people in place that could pass these down for many, many generations and experience this enlightened mental state. All right, is there anyone in the Zoom classroom that would like to chant these or chant this one? Okay, I think last time we did a pretty good thorough practice, so we'll just keep going with the teaching. This last chant that I will teach you is what I refer to as the ETP So. This one is, I feel, a little bit more intermediate level chant that it has a lot more syllables that are needed in order to kind of put this chant together. It took me quite a while to learn this one and actually do it proficiently in my practice. But if you apply dedication and commitment to learning, you can actually ramp this practice up pretty readily and actually develop this quite well that will help you in your meditation practice. So the way that this one is, is it's the same thing where you, you keep your hands together in with your palms facing each other and you would have already done the Arahang Sama Samputasa, you would have already done the Napotasa and then you would move right in to the ETP So and it sounds like this. Iti piso mahakava Half breath Arahang sama sam hoto So that's that similar phrase from the first chant. Take a nice deep breath here. We cha charanang sam huno little half breath sakato roka vitu nice deep breath here anu tero purisa little half breath dama sati sata tava manu sanam Half a breath. Puto Pakavati. And then that's the end where you would then slip into meditation. And that last part of that last phrase is something that shows up in a previous chant as well. So chanting those others kind of help you develop your practice of this one. So now let's go through this one three times. And I'll cue the breath at the different locations. And then on the second and third iteration, I won't cue the breath. So bring your hands together, palm to palm. Take a nice deep breath. Inhale. Iti piso makawa. Breath. Arahang Sama Sam Hoto Breath We Cha Charanang Sam Hono Breath Sakato Roka Vitu Breath Anu Tero Purisa Breath Dhamma Sati Sata Tava Manu Sanam Breath Puto Pakavati Okay, now let's do two more iterations without the breath being cued. Take a deep breath here. Iti piso mahakava Arahang sama samoto We 
ชาจารนังสามโนสขาตโรกาวิตุอนุเตโรภุริสาตามาสติสัตตาวามนุสนังภุตโตภาควัตีอิติปิโสมาควัอาระหังสัมมาสัมโมตุอุยจาจารนังสัมโนสัคคโตโรกาวิตุอนุเตโรภุริสาดามาสติสัตตาวามนุสนังภุตโตภาควัตติโอเค the translations here a little bit more involved the first line is he is the perfectly enlightened one A worthy one, a rightly self-awakened one. So we're declaring that this person is a Buddha, consummate in knowledge, in conduct. Consummate in knowledge. Consummate is like he's gone beyond. He's you know so far excelled in knowledge, in conduct. This is his moral conduct, his speech, his actions, his livelihood. In the Eightfold Path. It's separated into three different sections: the wisdom, the conduct, and the mental discipline. So this part of the translation is referring to his wisdom, is, you know, so far excelled in his moral conduct is as well. One who has gone the good way, so he's walking towards the light, or he's essentially. Enlightened, so he's gone the good way. He's left the darkness and moved towards the light. Knower of the worlds. This is the five realms that exist of beings: the hell, afflicted spirits, animal, human, and heavenly realms. Because as part of Gautama Buddha's awakening, he observed these five different realms, and he was aware of these five realms. So when you see this knower of the worlds, what it's referring to is he's the knower of these five realms and the beings within those realms. And then this last phrase, unexcelled trainer. So a Buddha is someone who's training human beings to essentially become more human, because in the unenlightened mind, the unenlightened mind functions very much like an animal. And the path to enlightenment is essentially evolving beyond our animal consciousness into becoming more and more human. Essentially, the vast majority of the beings born into the human world have been reborn out of the animal realm into this human realm. So, in the unenlightened mind, we often function very much like an animal. And then, as you get closer and closer to enlightenment. Moving into the first, second, third stages of enlightenment, ultimately the fourth stage is enlightenment itself. If you die in one of those stages, either the first, second, or third stage, or actually, I'm sorry, either the first or second stage, you are reborn back into the human world because essentially you've evolved the consciousness from this unenlightened mind. To this first and second stage of enlightenment, where now you've become more and more human. So, what a Buddha is is someone who is a trainer of humans, an unexcelled trainer, someone who's doing such a marvelous job at training other humans. And then added to this, it says of those who can be taught, because in order to learn and progress on this path. 
people need to make the choice to be learn to learn and actually practice the teachings you can't force somebody into learning and practicing these teachings you can't force someone to attain enlightenment that's not how these teachings work and you should never be in a position where you're actually trying to force or attempt to force people into learning and practicing these teachings because it just doesn't work that way so what this phrase or the first part of this phrase is referring to is the unexcelled trainer of those who can be taught or in other words those who choose to be taught and once someone chooses to be taught by a teacher or in this case the buddha then they will actually make progress in pursue pursuing this path to enlightenment but as long as somebody chooses not to learn these teachings then they're going to experience a discontent mind because they don't have the guidance and the training through confidence in the buddha through access to the teachings and through being part of a community of practitioners to actually choose to learn and practice these teachings to improve the condition of the mind to this enlightened mental state the last part of this phrase is teacher of human and divine beings because the buddha taught humans of course during his lifetime but there's also aspects of the pali canon where it describes that heavenly beings would actually come to the buddha during his lifetime and actually attempt to learn with him as well and there's various depictions of this in the pali canon because it's only in the human realm in the heavenly realm that one could actually attain enlightenment during in the lower realms which are hell afflicted spirits and animal realm the conditions of the consciousness and the conditions of those realms aren't conducive of one attaining enlightenment and being able to evolve their practice to an enlightened mind it's only in the human realm in the heavenly realm that beings can actually attain enlightenment in the human realm we experience all three feelings painful feelings pleasant feelings and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant these are like sadness anger frustration annoyance guilt shame fear happiness excitement elation boredom loneliness resentment jealousy all of these you know shyness things like that these feelings are experienced in the human realm and we have the ability to cultivate the consciousness so because we experience these three feelings and life is somewhat uncomfortable for us and some people might even say miserable, we actually have a lot of motivation in the human world and the ability to cultivate our consciousness to attain enlightenment. So the human world is the best uh, existence to actually learn and practice the teachings because you have the motivation, because you experience these three feelings and you have the ability to cultivate the consciousness to actually attain enlightenment in the heavenly realm so these divine beings they only experience pleasant feelings they don't experience painful feelings and feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant so the heavenly beings while they can cultivate their consciousness to attain enlightenment they aren't often motivated or encouraged to do so and they often become very complacent and they will oftentimes be reborn down into another realm if they don't attain enlightenment from that heavenly realm so while heaven sounds wonderful it's actually not a desirable rebirth because there's no guarantee that you're actually going to attain enlightenment in the heavenly realm and you're still existing you're still in the cycle of rebirth you haven't extinguished all the various problems in the mind to eliminate the cycle of rebirth you're still existing so you need to actually attain enlightenment in that heavenly realm or else you're going to be reborn back into another realm and the cycle continues but the buddha himself is the teacher of humans and divine beings and then the last part of this phrase is just kind of you know putting an exclamation point on this where it says 
awakened and perfectly enlightened. Once again, referring to this teacher of human and divine beings who is awakened, his mind is awakened to enlightenment and is perfectly enlightened. And that's what this particular chant refers to. So I would like to just pause here and see what questions you guys have about anything we discussed today or anything else that's coming up in your chanting practice, your meditation practice, or in learning and practicing any of these teachings of the Buddha along this path to enlightenment. Hi, David. Max, I'd like to know, what would be the cause for someone choosing to be taught? Everybody has their own reasons, right? Um, different people have different reasons. And, you know, if somebody is feeling and experiencing discontentedness and they become aware of these teachings, that might be a reason why they choose to do it. Or somebody could be experiencing in a pretty good, decent life, but they're still having some amount of discontentedness in the mind and they're looking to eliminate the discontentedness. Because when you look at the Buddhist teachings and you try to understand what did he actually teach, what is the actual goal of his teachings? Well, he says it repeatedly over and over and over, re-emphasizing and emphasizing over and over and over that what he taught is the elimination of discontent feelings. And because of those discontent feelings, it makes this existence somewhat miserable and whether you're experiencing sadness anger frustration irritation annoyance guilt shame fear even happiness excitement and elation is unsatisfying because it's not permanent oftentimes people are pursuing happiness excitement and elation but ultimately you realize that it's unsatisfying because it's not permanent and the enlightened mental state is permanent and even those feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant like boredom loneliness uh, shyness or resentment jealousy any of those other feelings they're all dissatisfying to the mind and that can be a motivation for somebody to understand that they're not content they're not peaceful and they would like to evolve past where they currently are and through doing so, you will experience a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy for the rest of this life. And then having attained enlightenment, you will no longer be reborn back into a new existence to experience the misery of existing over and over and over and over again, as we've been doing for countless lives. Anybody who is in existence today whether it's a human or an animal or any other being that exists today, has already had countless lives in the past. You may not remember those at this time, but as you learn and practice and awaken the mind, you may actually observe past lives. And what you will discover is there's been countless lives and you've just never gotten to the point where you've been close enough to these teachings that you've actually been able to learn them attain enlightenment and stop existing in some type of form or formless realm so there's multiple reasons why somebody might choose but i think it ultimately comes down to eliminating the discontent mind and eliminating this whole cycle of rebirth so that you kind of in this miserable existences that you keep cycling through over and over and over again Thanks, David. While we're still on the topic of chanting, you were talking about the benefits of Buddhist chanting, and you mentioned easing one's mind into meditation. I was wondering if you can recommend any other methods that can also do this in addition to chanting. Everybody can find, you know, for themselves what they feel would accomplish those same goals that I shared at the beginning. For me, it's always been going to the bathroom, emptying out all the organs, and then moving into chanting. For someone else, they might do a little bit of stretching or yoga. They might even take a walk in the park and kind of relax the mind. Everybody has a different way of doing things. Some people may even choose to pray, which isn't part of Gautama Buddha's teachings, but is something that I will teach on Sunday, not the actual prayer itself, but I will teach you if you have a prayer practice, how to ensure 
that you're doing that in a way that still leads to liberation of the mind because oftentimes when people are praying they're asking for things from some external entity or third entity and this is craving desire attachment which if someone has a practice of prayer in that way they won't be able to actually attain enlightenment so you can do yoga stretching you can do prayer you can do uh, walks in the park um, you can have a little sip of water uh, one thing that you'll notice is if you meditate on an empty stomach this can be really helpful so i will tend to meditate morning and evening when i first wake up i know the stomach's empty i will just use the bathroom and meditate right away and prior to going to sleep at nighttime i know that i haven't eaten anything for quite a number of hours and that's a really good anchor point to actually meditate and the body and the mind aren't busy trying to digest food so you can get more attentiveness and alertness in the mind to actively train the mind where even if i meditate in the middle of the day i will typically do that when either before eating or i will wait kind of an hour or so after eating before i have actually meditate now i have meditated with food in the stomach before but I just noticed that I don't get as much benefit out of it. So you can try those and see what you think. But I think what you'll find is that when you meditate with an empty stomach, this is a way to kind of ease the mind and get more benefit out of the actual meditation itself because the body and the mind aren't busy trying to digest food that you can focus on actively training the mind. Thanks, David. I found chanting very useful, but it's great to know that there are other methods too, depending on people's preferences. Yeah, everybody can come up with their own. And it's important to note that chanting isn't part of the path to enlightenment. So where everybody on the path to enlightenment would need to practice right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, these things are, are you know staples of this path to enlightenment that everyone would need to learn and practice in order to attain enlightenment but chanting is something that is almost optional it's not a required thing that if it helps you and you find benefit in it you can use it and help it use it to ease you into meditation but if you do it for several weeks or a few months and you're like yeah i really don't know that i really benefit from this and i don't really enjoy it that much I'd rather do prayer and yoga or, or take a walk or whatever, then you can do those things. The important thing is that you're meditating daily over your course of your life and that you're meditating you know, two or three times a day and that you ease the mind into meditation so that you get more and more benefit out of the meditation. And if chanting is a way for you to do that and it helps you, great, use that. But if you've got another method that you can use to ease the mind into meditation, then use that. You can do that as well. But the important thing is, is that you're meditating daily and you build up your practice more and more. All right, David. It seems that we're through with the questions related to chanting. So let's go on to general questions. We have a question coming in from Judith. She would like to know, who are the Rusi? Is their job to practice magic? Do they protect ancient sciences? Is their vow to stay in this plane until the next Buddha reaches enlightenment? So in Thai tradition, we call Lusi, or the way that you'll hear it pronounced kind of in India is uh, Rishi or Rishi, Rishi, um, or Rishis. And essentially the way that the Thais look at the Lucy are these are kind of like medicine people who are involved in traditional medicine. And they are practice, practitioners of Buddhist teachings, but they also have this knowledge of traditional kind of herbal medicine. And they typically will practice about 30 precepts where lay practitioners or household practitioners will practice anywhere between five, eight, or 10 precepts. And ordained practitioners will practice you know, upwards of 227 precepts. And the females will practice about 305 or 310 precepts, where the Lucy will practice about 30 precepts. And their whole goal in life is to, yes, to 
learn and practice the teachings of the Buddha to attain enlightenment, but also preserve this traditional tr uh, medicine, this herbal medicine, and healing the physical body through these herbal medicines. And that's their um, goal. Where this practice comes from is the original doctor of the Buddha. His name was Javaka Komarabhaka, or here in Thailand we refer to him as Shivaka Komarapai. Um, and his, he was the original teacher, or I'm sorry, he was the original doctor of the Buddha, and there's stories of him treating the Buddha for a medical uh, condition during the Buddha's lifetime. And anybody who's learning traditional medicine since that time here in Thailand, they kind of trace their lineage back to this historical figure of Javaka Komarabhaka as being kind of the founder of traditional medicine. And they will honor and respect him as the founder of their tradition. So uh, these Lucy are these kind of um, medicine people who are preserving these medical practices based on traditional herbal medicines and they do dive into kind of psychic abilities and uh, mystical magical things um, so they're they're not really ordained and kind of in this real discipline of this path to enlightenment they kind of dive into some of these special abilities that kind of arise as part of awakening the mind where as the mind awakens there's the potential that you might develop omniscience where you can actually know something's going to happen before it actually happens you might get psychic abilities where you can understand the past or the future of people's lives uh, you can uh, see people's auras for some people every person who awakens as they awaken they may or may not develop some of these special abilities and some people even in the unenlightened state have certain psychic abilities and as they awaken through these teachings those usually become more refined and more potent but one of the things to keep in mind and the lucy aren't really necessarily following this but one of the things that you keep in mind is that the goal of this path is to liberate the mind and attain enlightenment even though these special abilities will start to arise and you may notice them, you shouldn't hold on to them. You shouldn't crave them. You shouldn't practice this path in order to attain these special abilities. And the Buddha talked about this in his teachings, and he dissuaded people from using these special abilities for any kind of gain in your life, any kind of financial gain, because the potential might be that if someone becomes psychic or omniscient or having these special abilities that they might kind of use it as a way to produce income for themselves or financial um, support. And the Buddha talked about not doing this as part of his practices and his teachings because he knew that this was part of what happens when the mind awakens and he was interested in dissuading people away from using these special abilities or even embarking on this path because of those special abilities but instead stay focused on the actual goal, which is liberation. And that means that you don't even hold on and crave and desire or be attached to these special abilities, but let them go. But these Lucy will tend to kind of dabble in that, realm, in that um, area of special abilities um, more so than other people. And they'll kind of get involved in some of those things. But their number one, goal is to preserve the traditional medicine using herbal remedies. <clears throat> All right, David, we actually have a live question coming in from the Zoom classroom now. So I'll go ahead and unmute Arnold. I think Arnold's uh, audio is not working so well. Okay, well, we uh, did our best to vet him beforehand, but uh, he's now been rightly removed. So it's unfortunate, but um, maybe well, Arnold. 
and uh, if you ever fancy coming back, we'll be here. Yeah, it looks like uh, you guys didn't remove him only because his audio wasn't working, but he's sent some explicit chats in the Zoom classroom, so you guys removed him for that reason, not because his audio wasn't working, but uh, we wish him well <laughs> on his journey. <laughs> All right, so Excellent. any other questions that we've got coming in, James or Max? Well, I thought I would ask a question related to our last class about fear. I was wondering, we may have fears that we don't often have to confront. For instance, I have a fear of heights, but I very rarely am in a situation that triggers this fear. Is it important to work on fears and work on extinguishing fears, even if they're fears that we may rarely, if ever, face? Yes. You should still uh, pursue that and work on eliminating that fear because you never know when you're going to be in that situation. And also, if the fear is kind of like pushed back and it doesn't really happen but once every 10 years, that means the mind still is holding on to some kind of conditioning that is causing that fear. There's still some kind of conditioning in the mind. So even if it doesn't get triggered very frequently because maybe you've gotten to a point where you don't go in situations where you are high, so that's kind of your way of kind of getting around it, but that fear is still there, that conditioning is still there, that craving, desire, attachment of the mind that's holding on to some conditioning is still there. So you've got to get rid of that because if you don't, that means there's still what we call residual craving. And someone who has residual craving is only ever going to be able to attain the second stage of enlightenment. So if there's still residual craving, it means you're going to be reborn, even if it doesn't get the fear doesn't get triggered regularly, that it's still in the mind. So therefore, you're going to only be able to attain that second stage of enlightenment and there's going to be rebirth. So to get to true enlightenment where the mind's completely unconditioned, you've got to remove every single last condition in the mind. Thanks, David. I'll definitely have that to work on going forward. Yeah, that was one for me too. Uh, I never really liked heights very much and, um, uh, you know, so using ladders, James, going up on ladders, going on high buildings, looking over the side. Uh, if you have malls in your area that have multiple levels, um, you know, going up into the air. You know, if, if you take airplane flights, sit by the window, look outside a lot, even if the mind isn't comfortable with it. You know, find all these ways to get to the point where the mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy no matter what even when you're up high on a ladder or something like that absolutely we just had a question come in from judith she would like to know i guess when these psychic abilities arise it can be quite shocking and they might even be misleading is there a way to avoid them what would be a positive attitude aside of making business out of them I would say rather than try to avoid them, you know, which is pushing them away, right, like aversion, is just know that they can happen and they might happen. And if they do, just acknowledge them like, okay, there it is. And um, but don't try to hold on to it, um, because one of the other things you can get is you can get um, communication from other realms so that heavenly beings can communicate with you as your mind awakens even beings in the afflicted spirits and hell can communicate with you. And if you didn't know about this, you know, someone might think they're going mentally ill and they're unstable and go to a mental health ward um, and be given a lot of medications. And then the medications are going to suppress their awakening of the mind and actually inhibit getting to complete liberation because they weren't aware that these dark entities coming through or these divine entities that are coming through, these divine beings, are actually communication from other realms. So when you experience these kind of things, just acknowledge it for what it is. Don't try to hold on to it. Don't try to necessarily make any money with it. 
But for me, when these things started happening, I found myself in situations that I could actually help people. Um, for example, I when these things started happening for me uh, in a big, profound way, I was teaching at a temple where there was lots of tourists that came to this temple, you know, Thai tourists as well as tourists from other countries. And people would sit down with me at a table because we would just sit at this large table under these pavilions. And as tourists came into this large temple, they could come get help um, to learn the teachings of the Buddha. And people would sit down with me and I would know about their life and I would know about people that have died in their life. And I would start talking to them about this. And I would do it in a very polite and kind way. So like if somebody sat down and I would I would know like, OK, there's some being communicating with me and I would ask them, uh, do you have somebody who's passed away in your life? And one particular situation, this girl said, yeah, my dad ha has died. And I said, if you were able to talk to this person, would you be interested to talk to them? And she said, yeah, I would be. So then I started explaining, you know, what I was experiencing and what this person was interested in sh or what this being was interested in sharing with her. But she was open to it because I didn't want to startle her. And what I noticed is it actually helped her tremendously because her dad died, I want to say when she was maybe one or two years old. And she never had a relationship with her dad and she never understood why he died. In fact, nobody in her entire family understood why he died. They just woke up one day and he was dead. He was like 33 years old when he died. And I was able to tell her why he died. And I was able to explain to her that he was with her and, you know, what he was interested in seeing her do. Um, and he was thanking her for taking care of her mom because this girl takes really good care of her mom. But I also knew without her telling me that she felt this void in her life that she wasn't able to take care of her dad. And one of the things that her dad said to her in this conversation was that when you take care of your mom, it's the same as taking care of your dad. And through having this little dialogue with her, and it was only like a 10 or 15 minute chat about her dad, I could see it really relieved a lot of stress and pressure from her. And we talked for many hours that day about the Buddhist teachings, but just that small portion was about her dad. And then I saw her a couple subsequent days after that, that she had some more questions about things as well, the Buddhist teachings. So I found that these special abilities can be helpful for your own practice in terms of confirming these various realms and you'll know that they actually exist but they also help you to help others and i wasn't interested in any kind of financial gain from this person but just interested to help her and i helped some other people as well over the course of what i experienced maybe maybe 10 to 15 different beings kind of came to me and kind of at the opportune time to share something with somebody but i wasn't interested in holding on to any of these special abilities and just let them go but today there's still a certain amount of omniscience that is kind of stuck around not because i'm interested in it not because i want it but it's just there and a certain amount of being able to read other people's minds rather than kind of sit here and try to read somebody's mind there's often times where i'll be talking to people and I'll be able to, as I'm talking, I'll just start talking and they're like, wow, you're explaining exactly what's in my mind right now. Like, how did you do that? And I don't even realize that I'm doing it. It just happens. And that's, I think, the best way to approach these things is that don't try to show off. Don't try to be prideful. Don't try to be arrogant or egotistical. Don't try to make money from them. In fact, this right now is the only time that I've ever talked this extensively about these things, I don't talk to about them to people because it's not important to talk to people about them other than to kind of make people aware that they do happen. So that's some background from me that they do happen. You know, just be aware that these kind of things are part of the mind awakening and don't be startled if you are reach out to me as your teacher and let me know what's going on and i can help you the more that you learn and practice the teachings to include meditation the mind will become more and more stable 
so that these things, as they do happen, they won't startle you and you'll just be aware of what they are and see them for what they are. And then because there's the moral and ethical conduct there, you won't use them for financial gain. But if you're ever in a situation where you can help somebody through what you've developed as these special abilities, then you can help people. Because in that situation with that girl, if her mind, and it was before talking to her, her mind had this, you know, craving, desire, attachment to understand her dad, to know her dad. She never got to know him from one years old when he died. If she would have never encountered somebody that could share what I shared with her, she would have never been able to attain enlightenment. And I don't know where she is in her journey today, but that craving, desire, attachment she had to know her dad, to know what he died from, and all the people in her family who were really interested to know what he died from, they would have never been able to attain enlightenment as long as their mind had that craving, desire, attachment. So by coming in contact with somebody that could share that with them, it helped relieve that craving, desire, attachment. And that's where I talk in previous classes where I say there's two ways to eliminate a craving, desire, attachment. One is to actually actively eliminate it and work to eliminate it from the mind. But the other one is to fulfill it. And this is a perfect example of fulfilling that craving that she had this craving to know her dad, know why he died, as well as other people in her family. And by them now knowing that, that's been fulfilled and they can move on with the rest of the journey. So you may be in a position where you can help people at some point. And as your mind awakens, these other beings tend to tap into you because you're uh, easily accessible and open to that because your mind is, is awakened. Where when you're in the darkness and you know if you were using drugs and you were cussing and you were hateful and hostile and aggressive with people, these other beings, they can't really access you and you're not open to it anyway. So as your mind awakens and you're closer and closer to the light, so to speak, these beings are very easily able to access you and you can just see it for what it is, which is, okay, the mind's awakening. And then don't allow any ego, pride, honor, or gain associated with that to happen. Ben? As a follow-up on this topic, he would like to know, is omniscience different from intuition? Um, I think it's fairly similar. I think what we call intuition, you know, is really omniscience, where we might feel that we have a certain intuition that something's going to happen and that it actually happens, or we have a certain feeling that we should do something or shouldn't do something. That is what I would call omniscience, where you know something's going to happen before it actually happens. Um, I would consider them essentially the same things. Okay, we now have a question coming in anonymously. This person would like to know, if your family is not into Dhamma, don't force them, right? Because in my family, only am I into Dhamma, and I want them to know too, but they're not into it. So it's hard to convince them. I don't know what to do. Do you have any opinion? Yeah, so I suggest that you don't try to actively convince them. You wanting to convince them to learn and practice the teachings is your craving, desire, attachment. This is your mental longing with a strong eagerness. And you've got to remain unattached to what other people do. So if you have this, or you do, it sounds like, have this craving, desire, attachment, this mental longing with a strong eagerness, so you've got to eliminate that. It doesn't mean that you don't try to help people and you're not interested in helping people, but you've got to eliminate that longing with a strong eagerness where you want it so badly for these other people to learn and practice the teachings. So you've got to let that go. Otherwise, you aren't going to be able to progress and you're going to be inhibited from actually attaining enlightenment as long as you have this craving, desire, attachment, this mental longing with a strong eagerness for other people to learn and practice the Dhamma, you're not going to be able to attain enlightenment. <clears throat> so what you can do because you have loving kindness, which is active goodwill 
towards all beings without judgment and you have compassion where you have concern for others misfortune you can make it available for people to learn but you're not pushing them or forcing them to do so so some of the things that i usually recommend to people is like getting you know a book like this um, of the buddhist teachings and just having it around in the various space so if you're living with your parents for example and they've have no interest in learning the teachings and you know that very clearly then all you need to do is have a couple of these books printed out and around the house and you never know someday when they might pick up those those books and but you can't push them you can't ask them you know mom did you read the book did you read the book you really need to read the book why aren't you meditating you need to be meditating this is your craving desire attachment if you do that and it's going to inhibit you from attaining enlightenment so you've got to understand that each person needs to make their own choices and the only thing you can do is kind of um, make it available for them if they choose to step forward because in order to attain enlightenment there's a gazillion decisions that someone has to make in order to attain enlightenment so if they're not willing to make the very first decision that the path to enlightenment is something that they're interested in pursuing and interested in opening a book or accessing the teachings from a teacher, they're not going to be able to make all the other decisions that they need to make because they need to make the decision to meditate several, you know, two or three times a day. They need to make the decision to come to classes. They need to make the decision to open up books and learn with books, ask teachers questions. They need to make the decisions to look inward and understand what's going on in the mind and improve the condition of the mind if they're not willing to do these type of things then they're never going to attain enlightenment so if they're not willing or interested to make that very first decision to even you know choose to progress or even embark on this journey on the path to enlightenment then they're not going to make all those other downstream decisions that they need to make so it doesn't make sense for you to push and force someone and also think about your life what do you do when someone tries to force or push you to do things? The first thing you do is dig your feet in and say, no, I'm not going to do it. Because the more somebody pushes you and tries to force you to do something, the deeper and deeper you're going to dig your feet in because you don't like to be pushed and forced into doing something. So the more that you try to push and force somebody to actually learn and practice the teachings, the less successful you're going to be in that because they're just going to dig their feet in. So just lay some books around, lay some literature around. And if they pick it up, <clears throat> great, wonderful. If they don't, then that's fine too. You've got to be unattached to what others do. Otherwise, your mind isn't going to be liberated to enlightenment because you're wanting other people to do something so badly you've got to just let go it's a great point that craving is not only associated with our biases but it can also be found when we're attempting to help other people and their lives in the world yeah this is where you can see that there's no such thing as a good craving desire attachment uh, some people might share that there's such thing as good and bad attachments but all craving desire attachment is going to lead to discontentedness of the mind even if someone's attached to meditation or they're attached to the buddhist teachings and they have essentially what craving desire attachment is is this mental longing with a strong eagerness and as long as the mind has these wants these expectations this wanting of a certain outcome whether it's a good thing or a bad thing doesn't matter it's still going to cause the mind to be discontent so if somebody is attached to meditation and they can't meditate for a few days or a few 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 weeks while they're sick their mind is going to be discontent because they're attached to meditation or if somebody is attached having craving desire attachment this mental longing with a strong eagerness for the buddhist teachings then if they can't learn them or they're trying to push them onto other people and those people don't learn and practice those teachings, their mind's going to be discontent because of it. So the mind has to let go 
of all of this craving, desire, attachment. And that's why we call it liberation. It's this craving, desire, attachment that's got the mind bound up. And that's why it's not liberated. It's being motivated and pushed by this craving, desire, attachment, this yearning, this longing. And this is where the Buddha calls enlightenment the unsurpassed security from bondage because the mind is all bound up in this craving, desire, attachment. So to liberate the mind, you've got to let go of all of the craving, desire, attachments. doesn't matter if it's a good thing or a bad thing, whether it's cigarettes, alcohol, or any other addictive type thing like gambling, or whether it's meditation or um, the Buddhist teachings or uh, practicing generosity, you know, talking to your neighbors, all these things are good, wholesome things, but if you do it with craving, desire, attachment, it's going to eventually lead to discontentedness. So you need to practice what the Buddha called the middle way, where your mind isn't on one side or the other, but you find this middle way. And that's the suggestion I'm providing for this person is, you know, provide some literature around the different venues that you feel that people could benefit from the Buddhist teachings and then you know leave it at that and that's you practicing loving kindness and compassion but the more you try to push people the more they're going to dig their feet in and the more discontent your mind and the more discontent their mind is thanks david that seems to be all the questions we have for now okay well well thank you guys for joining for today's class this is the chanting that I do in the morning uh, when I do meditation. I do this before and after meditation. And then if I'm doing meditation in the middle of the day or evening, I'm also going to be doing chanting before and after meditation. And of course, there are certain situations where I don't do it, right? Where sometimes I do meditation going in. I'm sorry, I do chanting going into meditation. And then I do a really, really deep meditation maybe at nighttime. And after that, I feel really kind of drowsy and droggy and I just would like to go to sleep and I just go to sleep. I don't chant afterwards. So this isn't about permanence where you have to do chanting every single day and you have to do it this way and you have to do it that way. You, you know, you have to repeat these chants 10 times a day or else you're never going to get enlightened. That's not what chanting is about. Chanting is a tool that has been used for memorizing the teachings and passing them down for many generations. But if you do it, then you'll notice the benefits that we talked about at the beginning of class. And it can be an added benefit to your practice of meditation, where it will help ease the mind down into meditation and help ease it out when you choose to use it. So try it, practice it, Try it many, 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 many times before you choose that, okay, this is something that's really benefiting me and I'm going to maintain it as part of my practice, or this is something that I don't really think is benefiting me and I'm going to let it go and I'm not going to actually practice it. And that's fine for you to do, but be sure you practice it many, many times before you get to that decision and you decide that that's what you're going to actually do because you're interested in seeing the truth for yourself. Don't believe any teacher about what we say is good for your practice. Learn from your teacher and then go off and actually experience whether this benefits you or not. And if it does, you use it and you incorporate it into your practice. And if it doesn't, then you let it go. But in order to do that, you've got to try this many, many times before you determine whether it's something that you're not going to make part of your practice. So on Saturday at nine o'clock, we're going to be doing breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation. That's nine o'clock Thai time. So whatever time that is for you, you can look and you can join for breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation on Saturday at 9 p.m. Thai time. And then on Sunday, we're going to be in chapter 19, which is God's creative actions or God's creative activity. I can't remember if it's actions or activity. It's one of those. Um, you have free will. And this is a chapter that you can read 
or you can listen to the audiobook before class and or after class. But on Sunday at nine o'clock Thai time, I'll be talking through helping you understand how you can learn and practice these teachings to liberate the mind and attain enlightenment either with a relationship and understanding of God or without one. Because one of the biggest myths as part of the Buddhist teachings is some people will say that Gautama Buddha denied the existence of God. This is so untrue. If you read his teachings and you dive into the Pali Canon, he discusses God. So he does discuss God and he explains some things there that I will share with you, but also I will share with you from my own practice from my experiences of how you can either maintain a relationship with God or not and still move towards liberation of the mind. Because depending on what you've learned in other traditions about this entity of God, you may have picked up some conditioning that's going to inhibit you from attaining enlightenment if you continue to believe those things. So I'm going to share some truth and wisdom with you that you can independently confirm and verify on your own that you will see that it will help you to improve the condition of the mind through learning and practicing what I share with you as part of chapter 19 on Sunday. And then next Wednesday at this exact same time, we will be doing breathing mindfulness meditation. So you're welcome to join us for either Saturday, Sunday, or Wednesday at 9 p.m. Thai time. So have a really wonderful rest of your day. Enjoy continuing to learn and develop your Buddhist chanting practice. But what's most important in terms of what we've been talking about today is be sure you're meditating. Whether you ease into that with Buddhist chanting or something else, be sure you're meditating at least once, twice, or three times a day using breathing mindfulness meditation as I've taught and then slowly over time add in loving kindness meditation. And I'll teach you more of that in a future class. So have a wonderful day and we'll see you next time. Sawadee Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much.